Uh, Bronwyn is a clinical psychologist who works for the Department of Corrections and um, has a particular insight into um, this business of spirituality and uh, really what, what goes on in prisons is, a, is a, uh, a lot of psychological assessment and psychological programs. And it will be interesting to hear uh, Bronwyn discuss some of this in her talk uh, about uh, uh, spirituality and religion and clinical care. So I ask you to welcome her. Thank you. Kia ora, Greg. Thank you. It's just been such a wonderful morning that I'm not entirely sure how much more I can add to that, but I do hope that in our, in our discussions and certainly our question and answer time that we can explore and learn even more. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Mana Whenua, um, uh, University of Otago and Salvation Army for putting together this really incredible event. Um, you know, I, I completed my PhD six years ago and there really wasn't anything um, just to this extent and it's really, you know, quite incredible to watch this field just grow and grow um, and go from strength to strength, not least um, in part to the efforts of people like Richard and and people at um, Salvation Army and Otago who have really um, poured their heart and soul into getting this, um, getting this off the ground and really getting the word out there. Um, today I'd like to talk with you about the concept of kawa whakaruruho, or cultural safety, and the consideration of spirituality and religion in clinical care. Now, a little bit about my backgrounds. Um, not only do I work in uh, Department of Corrections half-time, I also work for a company called Proactive Rehabilitation um, in kind of neuropsychological assessments um, and rehabilitation and mental health care, um, but also write court reports and do treatment with um, people in the care of corrections as well. Uh, where I've come from, I grew up in the Kaipara district um, early in my life, in my adolescent years, I was a service user of both Oranga Tamariki and also of child and adolescent mental health services. And at that point in my life, spirituality was a really core aspect of who I was, my identity, and it was really important to me that that was considered in the care that I received uh, within child and adolescent mental health services. Um, to some extent that happened, to some extent it didn't. And that kicked me off into looking at this kind of area, really quite important area um, in mental health during my PhD and my clinical training. Um, when I first started on my PhD, there was a lot of rhetoric in the literature and also kind of journalistic rhetoric that basically said spirituality is missing from clinical care. And yet, I really struggled to find the evidence for this. I struggled to find a survey of, you know, or a large survey of clients that actually got clients' views on this. Um, and so I kind of thought, no, actually, let's go out and search for clients' views and what they say about this. Now, um, I think just quickly I'll refer to some of the work, um, or some of what Richard mentioned this morning, which was on um, looking at the association between spirituality and mental health and whether that effect is kind of more on the positive side or more on the negative side. And there are quite a few meta-analyses out there that have kind of combined um, a lot of research uh, linking spirituality to mental health. And essentially the overall conclusion has been the association is pretty weak. And why is that? I don't think it is because it, there's a lack of association. I think that actually what a meta-analysis does is it hides the nuances of how spirituality plays a role in our lives and in our mental wellness. And so when you dig into the literature a bit more and you start looking at, okay, when people utilize their spirituality in a positive way, it starts to get stronger associations with mental well-being. But when people utilize their spirituality in dysfunctional ways, you start to see associations with mental unwellness. And so it's not about the particular belief, it's not about the particular practice, 
but how it is used by that person and by their whanau, by the institutions and the systems around them, and what role it plays in their life. So in the course of gathering clients' perspectives on the role or the consideration of spirituality and mental health care, I came across this concept called kawa whakaruru ho. Now this was established in the late 80s um, during a nursing hui. And basically this came about after nursing students, particularly Māori nursing students, said actually my wairua, my beliefs, are not being taken into consideration here. And actually, I don't feel prepared to address wairua with my clients and with my patients. And um, Dr. Ramson and Elan Paps then formulated this concept of cultural safety. And what's important about kawa whakaruru ho is that it's not determined by a top-down perspective on what is safe, what is competent, and what is responsive. And in the words of Elaine Paps and Dr. Ramson, it is not the practitioner that determines the issue of safety. It is consumers or patients who decide what is, whether they feel safe with the care that has been given. Cultural safety assumes that each healthcare relationship between a professional and a consumer is unique, power laden, which is something that was discussed earlier today, and culturally dyadic. Kawafa Ho encourage us to recognise the unique perspective that each client has on their cultural identity and what they and their whanau want from practitioners in the consideration of that identity. It provides clients with the power to comment on practices and contribute to the achievement of positive health outcomes and experiences. It also encourages practitioners to avoid assumptions that individuals are somewhat homogenous in their beliefs, practices, or in their expectations or experiences of healthcare practitioners. So therefore, rather than making assumptions about clients' experiences, what do our clients actually say about the consideration of spirituality in their care? Um, this has kind of been addressed quite a few times today. I'll speak to it very briefly. So uh, I think it's really important for us to examine what are our own definitions of spirituality, of wairua, of religion. And more importantly, how does that actually influence your practice? How does that influence the policies that you contribute to? How does that influence your interactions with clients? And how does that influence the way that you ask about spirituality? or whether you don't ask. So um, as part of my PhD, I surveyed um, 750 mental health clients around the world. Um, 454 of those were New Zealanders who had utilised both uh, public and private mental health services. And that included 46 Māori services, uh, service users as well. Interestingly, despite all of this rhetoric that uh, the mental health system neglects uh, and minimises spirituality, half of the clients actually said their spiritual or religious beliefs had been taken into consideration and they were satisfied with the way that that had happened. So that was actually significantly more than what um, perhaps we had been expecting. Now, the flip side of this is that a full third of that sample, of, so over 100, more like 150, said, you know what, actually, no, my beliefs were not taken into consideration. I wasn't satisfied with the way that that happened. So I wanted to dig a little bit more into what were the things that clients actually wanted when we talk about considering their spirituality in their care. Um, two things is that set of two findings as part of that um, PhD was that satisfaction um, with the way that spiritual beliefs were considered was enhanced by disclosure, which is something that um, is often quite frowned upon in Western psychology. Um, so specifically, the practitioner actually saying, 
I share your beliefs, or I don't necessarily share your beliefs, but this is where this is the my take. This is how this is how I've seen spirituality as being important to recovery or playing a role in people's lives. It was the clients who were unsure where their practitioner stood that were the ones to report the least satisfaction. The other part was that uh, satisfaction was enhanced by the practitioner making efforts to understand the relevance of spirituality to that person's difficulties, but also to their recovery. And in fact, um, as far as explaining client satisfaction, that was far, by far and large um, the factor that contributed the most. So this is, um, this is actually data that I didn't present in my PhD. It hasn't actually been formally analysed, but um, it's something that I really, really wanted to dig into and present to you. Um, you know, as PhDs go, they get quite large <laughs> and you have to stop at some point. Um, but as part of the PhD, I collected a huge amount of qualitative data around how clients actually wanted their beliefs to be considered, or not, as the case was for some. Um, so for those where religion and spirituality was not considered but they wanted this, how? And by far the most common theme was actually just simply to be asked and then to have the space to describe how that was relevant to them. And then for those whose uh, beliefs they felt they weren't considered but they wanted that, there was a lot of fear, a lot of worry about how will I be perceived how will those beliefs be treated if I do disclose those to my practitioner? And so there was a, quite a significant theme around the avoidance of preaching, pathologizing, or assuming sameness, or, or even necessarily assuming relevance. There was a desire for spirituality to be explored as part of identity and as part of growth. And also for, um, and I, th I think this is um, links in quite strongly to this idea of Purako um, discussed earlier today, to explore lessons or principles or values from spirituality and how that applies to the person's situation there and then into their recovery. Uh, finally, to explore access to spiritual resources, so to, um, to basically, um, so spiritual elders or to um, communities of faith um, and so to explore those with the clients. And finally, there was a fairly consistent theme about, particularly for clients who had not discussed this, is to look at accessing a practitioner who shares their beliefs. Interestingly, for those who did feel that their spiritual beliefs were considered in their care, that need to see a practitioner who shared their beliefs was no longer part of the rhetoric. In fact, clients who had seen a practitioner who did not share their beliefs were just as satisfied with the way their beliefs were taken into consideration as those who saw a practitioner who did share their beliefs. And I, I kind of I was of taken aback by that, so I was quite surprised, um, particularly con considering my own experience as a young person. But I think what that speaks to is that as practitioners, if we maintain an open and curious attitude, and we're genuine in that, and we truly allow the clients to speak, to have their voice, and to explore spirituality, then I, it, I think it goes a long way uh, to contributing to satisfaction. Um, that isn't to say that actually there are some clients who when they ask for someone who shares their beliefs, um, that we shouldn't make every effort to try and find that for them. Um, so for those where spirituality and religion, now I use those interchangeably because in the, I looked at both um, in the thesis, what helped? An attitude of the practitioner was absolutely the number one thing. If the practitioner was someone who 
It's all right bringing this up. Someone who was curious, interested, compassionate, and accepting and non-judgmental, that really helped clients trust in the practitioner to help them to start to explore spirituality and the role in their mental health more. Um, allowing the client to take it at their own pace, that trust is really, really important. Taking time to explore religion and spirituality as an aspect of coping and identity. And this came out as quite a consistent theme as well, taking time to explore the unhelpful side of spirituality. Um, I think sometimes we might shy away from that, but it actually was really quite important to a number of these clients. Disclosure, whether or not you share those spiritual beliefs, um, how you share them, what you see the role of spirituality in mental health care as being. Checking in, when we discuss spirituality in our care, am I on the right track? Are you comfortable with this? And incorporating practices, does the client want karakia? Do they want music? Do they want meditative practices? Do they want to sit in nature as part of their mental health care? And then finally, there were a group of people that really didn't want their spiritual beliefs to be considered in their care. And I think this is really important because if we're going to talk about and apply cultural safety to the idea of spirituality and mental health care, for some people, they don't want that. Um, a whole a, a bunch of reasons here. Clients, some clients didn't see it as relevant. Some clients felt that it was too personal. And this is important as well. And in terms of setting up a safe space, Sometimes clients are quite worried about being judged or misunderstood in terms of their spiritual beliefs. And there was um, interesting, you know, Egan talked about the bioreductionist model. I've, it came across in this qualitative data just how much some clients had actually internalised that bioreductionist model for themselves and saw their spiritual side and their medical side or mental health side as being completely different things. Um, and so I, th I think we need to be aware of that and work, work with clients as well. And some actually really saw the idea of bringing their spirituality into their mental health care as so threatening to their spirituality that they wanted to keep it to themselves because it was such an important resilience tool that they actually felt that, you know what, if I bring this, is that going to be transformed in some way into something that's negative? Is it going to be associated with problems? And so exploring that with clients is quite important. So some practical ideas for setting up a culturally safe approach kind of coming out of these themes. Listen and explore. You know, um, we were one of the speakers in the previous sessions was talking about um, Okay, so we're at, we ask about spirituality, if that's the first step, but then what? And I, I think we get quite anxious about, you know, I need to know exactly how I'm going to address spirituality with this person and, and in their mental health care, but actually often the client has so much wisdom. If only we give them the space and choose to explore that with them. Encouraging client comments. Um, Mark mentioned um, earlier today, um, eliciting negative feedback. And actually, that is one of the core concepts of Kawa Whakaruru Ho, is that we allow clients, in fact, we invite clients to comment on our practice. We are not safe until our clients decide that we are safe. And how do we know unless we ask them? And so um, just in terms of my own practice, here are some of the questions that I ask my clients if we start discussing spirituality. Is this okay? Are we on the right track? Is there anything I could be doing better when we do discuss your spiritual beliefs? Is there anything I've overlooked? Is there anything that makes you feel uncomfortable? Thank you. <laughs> um, one thing that's kind of tended to make me bristle a little bit when I was um, doing this work in my PhD is whenever I mentioned that I was looking into this area, 95% of the responses were, ooh, what about when people start incorporating spirituality into their psychosis? 95%. And it was incredible just the amount of stigma and the judgment associated 
with actually just that topic when you start talking about it. And so, but when it comes down to it, do we really need to directly challenge what we perceive to be harmful beliefs? Are they actually harmful? And I think often um, in mental health care we make assumptions about particular beliefs, if they seem strange or different to ours, that somehow they might be harmful. And I think it's really important to educate our colleagues um, on the ideas that actually, often they're not. They might sound harmful to us, but are they really causing harm? And if they are, often there's an, there's an alternative way of actually building up the positive and the strengths-based focus of their spirituality. There's often alternative beliefs in a, um, in a belief system that we can build. And again, coming back to cultural safety, respect for the client's autonomy, even when we feel uncomfortable. Um, how much time have I got? Yep, yep, okay. So just th um, three recent cases that I've worked with. Um, a, so I'll jump to the second one. Um, recently working with a client convicted of murder. Um, he's kind of been in and out of the system for 30 odd years. And I was discussing with him kind of what his views on kind of what caused him to end this person's life. And he said, I, I don't know, it was just this external demonic force that just took over me and I had no control, I had no... And he has subsequently committed a number of additional um, crimes. And I started to explore with him what's allowed you to not be taken over by that force at other times. And so now we've spent quite a bit of time actually building his positive spiritual practices and actually starting to build this belief that actually he is not at the mercy of this external force. He's not at the mercy anymore because he started to develop these ideas that actually he has choice. He has been given also the power to win life but also to preserve life. Um, we, I've also very recently been working um, with a client who was assaulted in her own home and every time she walks into the lounge she's completely overtaken with images um, of this person coming at her and um, she is a Samoan Catholic and we've worked quite closely together to um, look at okay so how do you build that sense of safety what role does spirituality play in providing you with that. So she has actually developed a whole set of coping mechanisms based in her spirituality. She's had her pastor come into the house and bless the, bless the area where the assault happened. But also we've started to look at what purpose does this give you? How do we look at how your spiritual beliefs contribute to growth after this horrendous situation? Um, and she's starting to now come out of... Um, those kind of that experience of trauma with actually a strengthened identity of herself as a Samoan woman who holds some spiritual beliefs that have really contributed to her progress um, and can also be used to help others who have been through kind of similar experiences. And I think that is essentially it. <laughs> Thank you. Can we have some microphone runners, please? Richard, perhaps, David. Bronwyn, that's a uh, terrific presentation and, and a very practical presentation. Told us things that um, perhaps we didn't know, things we did know, and things we might never know. Um, okay, let's have some questions. Hi. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, my name is William. I work for Salvation Army Oasis and other addiction fields. Um, it was just more of a comment, really, that it was really encouraging to hear you finding that whether or not the practitioner shared the belief helped because what you were saying started to echo a lot of my base training, which is humanistic Rogerian counseling. Um, and I was thinking about the concept of self actualization and if that is a spiritual concept, possibly, where a person connects to some deeper part of themselves and can find their own solutions to their problems. Um, 
and that on and that can be fostered out of unconditional positive regard or non-judgmental, but just the power of listening and being curious. Because in my experience, I've sat with many people who are exploring these ideas of why do I exist, what's the point of it all. And I needn't share that, but I can certainly be with them. And it's just something I'm passionate about, so I'd like to share that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Rowan, thank you for your presentation. Um, my opinion about spirituality and mental health. I believe when a person has faith in Jesus, this person will learn to become more loving and forgiving, and it creates... Um, the peace and the calm to look at things. And I believe that by reading a Holy Bible or strengthen a person and receiving medication for the mental health, um, the patient will recover soon and they'll have a good life. This is what I believe. Thank you. Um, I, I think absolutely there's um, that really beneficial effect when people reconnect with their faith and with their spiritual beliefs, absolutely. I think it's just as important to sometimes look at, you know, is it always a positive effect? What does a person need to talk about? Actually, sometimes there are tensions between their faith and what they do and other things that they believe, or tensions with themselves and their faith community as well, or tensions between their spiritual beliefs and their culture. It's really important to explore those things. Kia ora. I loved listening. So I'm Dr. Dai. Um, I love Hello. listening to your um, call there, though. I, um, so much of what you said resonated when it comes to thinking about patient and population factors. The issue is, is that we have inequity for Māori in New Zealand, huge disparities. And so the health professional factors, which you sort of alluded to about one's spirituality and one's religion, and even though you have that belief, how are you perpetuating colonization mm. through instilling that belief in the institutions, but also in addressing systemic factors. And I wondered how you might um, address the same way of being that you're showing us as a health professional and those factors that can address the inequity. So such things as spirituality pre-colonization and when a Māori is in distress, they usually have to look down and think, oh my gosh, what do I believe? Oh, that's right, I'm disconnected from my belief. How do you incorporate the story of colonization in the room? And how do you ensure that dominance of your way of being doesn't perpetuate systemic issues? Thank you, I think that's, that's really, really important. I think one, one thing, just a couple of reflections on that. One thing is that as part of the PhD, there was um, essentially an influence of policy on whether or not people's beliefs were taken into consideration. And that was where policy was, was written into health standards. And in New Zealand, we don't have that written into our health standards to actually consider why do and to consider the spirituality of our clients. Funnily enough, it's written into the US health policy. So I think this needs to happen at a much broader level, but actually in the room, I mentioned before about how some clients have internalized that bioreductionist approach, and I see that very much um, for some people as essentially internalizing colonization. And I think if we come into the room and we make assumptions about what wairua looks like, what spirituality looks like, we're just simply perpetuating that colonization. And so I think inviting negative feedback, inviting comment, inviting constantly that person to be fully involved in the consideration of their spirituality is really important. Um, and also to address, I, I mean, I, I've worked in a quite a number of um, residential environments, one being prisons, um, also other residential mental health care um, situations. And I think it's um, incumbent on us to educate and to actually address these issues with other people that work with our clients as well, not just with the client themselves.
But if we see institutional racism, if we see a system that does not consider the person's spirituality, the wairua, as being an integral part of them, then it's our responsibility to challenge that. Hello, my name's Colin. I'm a staff nurse in Christchurch. Uh, firstly, in the group of people that said they didn't want to be, uh, they wanted to avoid being preached to, were they all non-religious or was that also people who were religious that didn't want to be talked to by somebody that was from a different faith or a different denomination within their own faith? So all of the people who took part in that survey identified as either spiritual and or religious. Um, so they all held some kind of um, some kind of faith. So and then to add on to that, just what you've been saying to uh, Di, then um, it is really odd because I've been doing some work over the last couple of years and found that um, there was a big document published by the Ministry of Health about 2010 about how to improve the care, spiritual care for patients with cancer in New Zealand. And um, I think I'm fairly safe in saying that none of the recommendations in that document regarding spiritual care have been even addressed, never mind met. And then the Code of Rights for the Health and Disability in, uh, Commission in co covers that. And Section 21D of the um, Human Rights Act, you, I, I can tell you, but I've read that a few times because I know exactly which number it is. That tells you that you can't be di um, discriminated against because of or having a particular faith or having no faith or whatever. But Christian, like you said, Christian, why is there nothing in faith in our guidelines for health? You know, why aren't we meeting what's there? Uh, quite a broad question. <laughs> Um, but, um, yeah, it's an observation that I've made. Um, I've, I worked for a couple of years in service development in the Department of Corrections. And to be honest, it's not just spirituality. It's actually te ao Māori in particular that has been completely ignored at that level. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, work really needs to happen at those levels to really ingrain um, genuine consideration of spirituality and of te ao Māori. Yeah. I wonder if I could ask Bronwyn a question about your profession. Um, psychological assessments and psychological reports done in all sorts of different clinical and custodial settings really, in my experience, really mention anything to do with a person's uh, connection with their own spirituality, their own religion what they believe. What we see is a lot of stuff about the past of the formation, how they've got into the difficulty they have, and recommendations for the future. What is it that it's going to take your profession and us to change that? I'll try to talk all that. <laughs> Uh, yes, training, but also, um, you know, psychologists, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of focus on what we call clinical formulation, and that's understanding how the person's context and their identity influences where they've got to and where they're going. Um, and in training, there is no focus on spirituality and wairua, te ao Māori identity. Um, I think... Uh, there's been a lot of work towards incorporating um, spirituality into treatment. But when we're pushed into a one-hour assessment, I think that's we tend to um, prioritise things that our Western models teach us to prioritise, uh, and the priority is often not spirituality. But I think it takes a, a cultural change, um, which I think we are seeing, um, to start to incorporate that. And I think... Sometimes on, with mental health practitioners, I certainly have experienced this for myself, there is a fear of how you will be seen as a mental health practitioner with your um, institution if you start to incorporate um, these considerations. So there's that to consider as well. A supplementary question? Um, <laughs> um, I, it, oh, sorry. 
I do have a supplementary to that. There was some research done on a community of nuns um, and they followed these women and then at their death they did autopsies and found that their brains had the same amount of damage that would have been would have classified them as having dementia. Um, but they didn't exhibit it up until their death. They didn't have any signs of any dementias. And, and you would think then that that would be at least reason to explore the effect of spirituality on people's mental health, if, it's, if it can affect their organic um, experience. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a big difference between physical um, physical changes and impairments and disability and function. Um, and I think you know I have quite a strong emphasis, a strong interest actually on the role of what, well, what we call cognitive reserve when someone's brain begins to deteriorate, but it's not actually showing in their functioning. What is preventing that from actually um, impacting on that person's functioning? And I, I do believe that spirituality is a part of that. Right. Yes, more questions? Um, I've got the microphone. <laughs> Just a brief, not a... So do I. <laughs> yeah, not, not a speech, please, but a question. Um, this was just a, just a question based, I guess, on what you'd mentioned there about sort of mental health practitioners. Sorry, I'm Claire, and I'm um, based at Vic Uni, uh, Student Health and Counselling, Māori Ora. Um, and I guess just coming up to what you said there about kind of, you know, an hour's assessment, and there's a big push with sort of, I guess, increasing demand in my service, certainly for, um, you know, service and, and counselling service um, for kind of short-term brief intervention work. Um, and absolutely, you know, I've been quite inspired this morning listening to all these, you know, fabulous um, talks around Wairoa and how, the importance of that, particularly within this community. Um, and I think also for our student population as well, and just how that fits really with a kind of brief um, short-term intervention approach and how we can sort of take that back, I guess, to the service and, and how we incorporate that into, into what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, and I think, um, you know, I talk about um, priorities and, and short-term, you know, when you're, when you're sat with a client for 30 minutes, one hour. Um, quite a number of the clients and the qualitative data that I collected said, even if you just put it on the form, which is kind of sad, actually, because really we should be able to have a conversation. But even the fact that, it, that so many clients actually just wanted to have the opportunity to say something, and so that their suggestion was, even if it was just on the intake form that I filled out, then that would have given me the space to start that conversation. All right, thank you. Last question. There is a concept emerging in academia, um, I reference the works of David Tacey in Australia, that all belief systems are systems of metaphors which don't um, disqualify other systems of metaphors, and that recognition can be very useful, I think, in this whole area that we're discussing. And I wondered if that was something that you or other people have come across. Um, certainly did in the qualitative work, but I think what that speaks to is the importance that we recognise our own assumptions about what spirituality is and our own metaphors for that. And if we don't recognise that, how, how can we actually open our, our vision to our clients' metaphors and our clients' perceptions and interpretations of spirituality? Thank you. Thank you, Brahman, for a very stimulating presentation. And I can tell you that um, if I, I could tell you that if I'm ever, ever in prison, I certainly will be asking you to uh, say <laughs> grand uh, It's my great pleasure to give you a small gift as appreciation.